This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. How did the entire world get this fat, this fast? Did everyone just become a bunch of gluttons and sloths? Obesity has been around since there were people. It's been around for 50,000 years, easy. And it was around before McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's. It was around before Coca-Cola. Obesity is part of the human condition. And there are evolutionary reasons why obesity has been selected for in individual populations. Because people who store energy are more likely to be able to survive periods of famine. So there is a selection process that goes on all the time. But none of those things explain how in 30 years we have gone from being svelte, if you will, to basically being unbelievably sick. That's what an epidemic or a pandemic in this case looks like. That's what plague, influenza looked like. And the question is, what would be the exposure that could account for this? And if it was just gluttons and sloths, how do you explain the obese six-month-old? We have an epidemic of obese six-month-olds in this country. They don't diet and exercise. You're going to call them a bunch of gluttons and sloths? This goes way beyond the question of personal responsibility. We have felt like it's the individual's responsibility to keep their energy balance, to eat the right amount and stay the right weight. But when something goes wrong, like the majority of the population becoming overweight, we have to question that model and we have to look at the forces outside of ourselves, these huge societal environmental forces that are shaping obesity. The reason we're in this epidemic can be summed up with one statement, one idea that has become so pervasive that it has become sacrosanct, that it has become dogma. And that statement is, a calorie is a calorie. It's the first thing dietitians learn in dietary school. If you eat more than you burn, you will gain weight. If you eat less than you burn, you will lose weight. And it doesn't matter if those calories come from carrots or cheesecake. The bottom line is, a calorie is a calorie. You eat too much, you exercise too little. And that's the mantra, and guess what? It doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because a calorie is not a calorie. The only dogma is there is none. Choose your favorite hypothesis. There's so many. Well, you know, what is it in our environment? Is it just the excess of food? Is it the high fructose corn syrup? Is it the antibiotics we're taking? the estrogens, different hormones and hormone mimickers? Is it the intrauterine environment? All of these factors play a role. So it is not just one thing. I mean, if there's one big thing, it's of course, it is our food environment. Fast foods, fast preparing, fast eating, and fast causing disease too. And we in our two-parent working, two-hour commuting, two-job life do not have time for food. This is the biggest issue that we currently face. It is the reason that the industrial global diet has taken over the world, is because with all of our 
labor-saving devices with the cars and the computers and lawnmowers that you sit on instead of push, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things have actually reduced our time, not created it. So this is a function of the changes that we have made in our society, ostensibly for our benefit. The question is, are they? Well, there's been a number of changes um, in the last 30 years in how we interact with food, with our food supply. There's over 24,000 different foods that enter the marketplace every year. Then there's the issue of sleep patterning, stress, how we feed our animals, the nutrients in the soil. There's a number of, of different issues at play. All of these converge on, I think, uh, adding to something to the obesity epidemic. The Western diet, our diet, that we prize and export all over the globe has now become the industrial global diet because it's cheap, it's portable, it has no depreciation, witness the 10-year-old Twinkie, and it was designed to taste really good, to keep people eating. This is now everywhere. This is the exposure. This is what, what has changed. I think we have had a perfect storm. We have had the confluence of this changed food environment, the restricted activity, like no PE in schools, and chemicals that we're not quite sure what we're being exposed to. And they're working together. Boy, does that look good. But honey, what will these calories do to my waistline? Relax, it's diet delight. There was a big war in the food uh, field back in the 60s and 70s. And the war was fat or sugar. And so we were remanded as a country to reduce our consumption of fat from 40% to 30%. Well, guess what? We did it. We are there. But the total consumption of calories, and specifically carbohydrate, and especially sugar, has gone through the roof. So it was that directive, that edict of the late 1970s that started the obesity and metabolic syndrome ball rolling. It is almost impossible to buy those packaged foods without getting a lot of extra sugars that are just going to be toxic for your metabolism. I'm suspicious of anything that says low fat or diet because you know that that means that they've had to compensate with a lot of these added sugars. A perfect example, snack wells. So what's a snack well? Two grams of fat down, 13 grams of carbohydrate increased, four of which are sugar. No fewer calories, same number of calories. And if fat's not the problem, and sugar is, you can see where we're going here. And there's also the change in the food supply so that those highly palatable foods are more easily accessible. So we can reach for that comfort food uh, at any street corner, at any time during the day, and have a few extra calories. When we talk about the diseases of obesity. We are talking about type 2 diabetes, hypertension, lipid problems, so blood fats, if you will, heart disease. Those are sort of the big four, if you will, that constitute what we classically call the metabolic syndrome. However, we now know that there are several other diseases that fall within this scope as well. For instance, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which now affects one-third of all Americans. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, which affects 10% of all women. Cancer, and also dementia. Now here's the key. Everyone thinks that those downstream diseases are because of the obesity. 
and that could not be further from the truth. The obesity travels with those diseases, but the obesity is a marker for those diseases. 20% of obese people have a completely normal cellular metabolism, and they will live to a normal age. 40% of thin people, normal weight people, have those same chronic metabolic diseases and will die of them. Nobody dies of the obesity per se. They die of the diseases that come from the metabolic dysfunction. So when you do the math, that accounts for 60% of America. We are not talking about a minority. We are talking about the majority. So when you add up the medical costs for those eight diseases, that is 75% of health care expenditures. Not just ours, not just America, but all over the world. So much so that in September of 2011, the United Nations Secretary General announced that non-communicable disease, that is chronic metabolic disease, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, cancer, dementia, now posed a bigger threat to the developing world, not the developed world, the developing world, than did acute infectious disease, and that includes HIV. This is enormous. This is mind-boggling. This is absolutely staggering that developing countries have a bigger problem with obesity and diabetes than they do with cholera and other infections. When you think about that, that really has to stop and give you pause. Something is going on here. There are a lot of arrows these days pointing to sugar, refined sugar, high fructose corn syrup, that these are really causing some pretty wacky metabolism that didn't exist when we were eating more of the complex carbohydrates. We've done a recent analysis of the Food and Agriculture Organization database. We've linked it to the International Diabetes Federation database, country by country. And what we have found is that while total calories do explain an increase in diabetes rates around the world, the effect size is very small. But when you start breaking it down by what those calories are, it turns out the only one that correlates with the increase is sugar. A calorie is not a calorie. Sugar is 50 times more potent than total calories in explaining diabetes rates worldwide. When we started putting fat and carbohydrate on the same plate in the 1700s, we became gourmets. In the 20th century, when we started putting fat and carbohydrate in the same food, we became gourmands. It's when you put fat and carbohydrate together that they don't work. And sugar, because of its unique composition, is the only food on the planet that is both fat and carbohydrate at the same time. Even fatty fruits coconut, olive, avocado, have no carbohydrate. There is no food stuff on this planet that has both fat and carbohydrate at the same time. It's one or the other because that's evolution, that's nature, that's what God did, except for sugar. So you say, wait a second, sugar? Where's the fat in sugar? Ah, sugar's made up of two molecules one called glucose, which is not very sweet and not very interesting, and fructose, which is very sweet and very interesting, and it's the thing we seek, it's the thing we crave, and they are not the same. Glucose and fructose are 
very different. Glucose is metabolized by all the organs in the body. Every single living organism on the planet can digest, absorb, and metabolize glucose. Glucose is the energy of life. If you don't have glucose in your diet, your body makes it because your cells run on it. And 80% of the carbohydrate glucose that you consume is metabolized by all the organs in the body. Only 20% go to the liver. Fructose, on the other hand, is not glucose. Fructose can only be metabolized in the liver because only the liver has the transporter for fructose. All of the fructose goes to the liver. So you're overloading your liver. That's the rub. The fructose goes straight to the mitochondria, gets turned to fat, a little bit of glucose goes to glycogen until it's replete, and then it goes to fat as well. And you have a recipe for mitochondrial meltdown, mitochondrial constipation, mitochondrial disease. And when you have mitochondrial disease, you get sick. Fructose is a chronic, dose-dependent, hepatotoxin, liver toxin, which is just like alcohol. In fact, fructose, the sweet part of sugar, is more like alcohol than it is anything else. Alcohol is metabolized to fat, and so is fructose, driving more liver fat that it can't export, more liver insulin resistance, which drives the pancreas to make extra insulin, driving energy deposition into fat cells peripherally, driving your weight gain, and the extra insulin is driving high blood pressure, driving heart disease, driving cell division, which leads to cancer, driving changes in the brain, which lead to dementia, driving every single one of these diseases. And when your pancreas can't make enough insulin and it burns out, it drives diabetes as well. And if you look at the diseases of alcohol and the diseases of sugar and obesity, they are the same. Now, fructose and alcohol can both be nutrients. They supply energy. They're natural. And if you're starving or you're glycogen depleted because you just ran a marathon, fructose and alcohol can be used to rebuild your energy stores. And in which case, they are not toxins. But if you're not running a marathon, then what your liver cells do with both fructose and alcohol is turn it into liver fat, then it's a toxin. People think that when you add sugar to food, it has nothing to do except increased taste. Not true. When you add sugar to processed food, you kill it and it's killing us. We have created a toxic environment. Now, Kelly Brownell at Yale University first coined the term the toxic environment in 2004 in his book Food Fight. And what he was referring to was the changes that we have made in our society that foment obesity. For instance, food available as never before food available in places unrelated to eating. Like, for instance, whoever heard of having dinner at a gas station? But we do. Designed to taste really good to keep us eating. All of these are absolutely true, and all of these are very important in terms of the obesity epidemic, and I do not make light of them. They are important, but what we're talking about here when we talk about the toxic environment is real toxins real poisons, things that actually damage your mitochondria and make you sick. That's what I'm talking about. This is about something that we are exposed to, that is going on worldwide, that has changed in 30 years. And there's only one thing that has, and it's sugar.
The one thing that we know categorically that can mitigate chronic metabolic diseases is reduction in calories. And of course, that's why your doctor says, eat less, exercise more. Even I would like to be able to say, eat less, exercise more. The problem is, it can't be done. It's not doable. And there are reasons, there are biochemical reasons why it's not doable that have to do with new hormones that have just been discovered. For instance, one called leptin. Leptin is a hormone that goes from your fat cell to your brain and tells your brain you've had enough and that you can burn energy at a normal rate and feel good about it. It limits what you eat and it lets you exercise spontaneously because you want to. Obesity, you have high levels of leptin because you have lots of fat because it comes from the fat cell. But if leptin were doing its job, then you wouldn't be obese. So how do you explain high levels of leptin and still eating too much? Clearly, the leptin is not doing its job. And we call that leptin resistance. And discovering the cause of leptin resistance is the holy grail of obesity research. It is the nugget of truth that we all seek. How come leptin used to work 30 years ago and doesn't work today? That's what it's all about in a nutshell. And our research has demonstrated some very specific, significant findings. And I can sum it up in one word, insulin. Now, everyone knows insulin. Everyone knows it's the diabetes hormone. Diabetics take shots of insulin to lower their blood sugar. Indeed. So let's take a diabetic off the street, any diabetic. Blood sugar is 300, that's high. We give that diabetic a shot of insulin. Blood sugar goes from 300 down to 100. That's good, right? Blood sugar went down by 200 points. Where'd the 200 points of blood sugar go? They were in the blood, now they're not. They went somewhere. They went to the fat for storage. That's insulin's job. That's not a mistake. That's what it's supposed to do. Insulin shunts sugar to fat, period. Insulin makes fat, period. More insulin, more fat, period. Insulin drives weight gain. And I can explain how this works. Let's take you, nice and thin. You eat 2,000 calories a day, you burn 2,000 calories a day, you feel good, normal day. Are you gonna gain weight, lose weight, or stay the same? You stay the same, because you burn what you eat, nothing to store, fine. Now let's do a little experiment. I'm gonna put an IV in your arm and tape it down. I'm gonna follow behind you, and every time you reach for food, I'm gonna pump you full of extra insulin in that IV. Insulin you didn't want or need. I'm going to over-insulinize you just like we do our diabetic patients. So, you wake up in the morning, you start eating 2,000 calories just like before, but now, because of the excess insulin I'm pumping you full of, 500 of those 2,000 calories straight to fat. Like what the IRS does to your paycheck. Right off the top, gone before you had a chance to spend it, in this case, gone before you had a chance to burn it. You are now 500 calories heavier. If you stood on a scale, you would weigh a seventh of a pound more, whether you liked it or not, because of what I did to you. Now, you ate 2,000, but you lost 500 to your fat. How many are left to burn? 1,500, except for one thing. Your body wants to burn 2,000 because that's where it feels good. And how many calories you burn and how good you feel are synonymous. Things that make you want to burn energy, things that increase your energy expenditure make you feel good, like exercise, caffeine. Things that reduce your energy expenditure make you feel lousy, hypothyroidism, starvation. So how many calories you burn and how good you feel are the same. You only have 1,500 to burn, but your body wants to burn 2,000. So what do we call that? That's called starvation. So how do you feel when you're starved? crappy, tired, slothy, sit on the couch, don't want to do anything, 
don't want to exercise, maybe watch TV or play video games. Sound familiar? And of course, hungry. And in a world of free access to food, which we all live in, what are you going to do? Eat back the 500. So now, instead of eating 2,000 calories, now you're eating 2,500. You've increased your food intake to compensate for the effects of the excess insulin. Except, haha, I'm still pumping you full of insulin. 100 of those 500, right off the top, straight to fat. Now you're 600 calories heavier. You're only up to 1,900 to burn. You still don't feel perfect. So you go to a doctor, you go to a nutritionist, you say, Doc, every time I stand on the scale, I weigh more and I don't feel so good. What's going on? Why am I fat? And the doctor looks at you and says, I know why you're fat. You're a glutton and a sloth. You eat too much, you exercise too little, and guess what? He's right, it's true. You are. But it's not because you chose to, it's not because you want to, it's because you have to. It's a biochemical drive set up by the insulin I pumped you full of. So you say, okay, well, that's all well and good. But how does that explain what happened in these 30 years? No one's pumping me full of insulin. Ah, yes, they are. You're not being pumped full of it. You're making it yourself. But you're making it because of the change of the industrial global diet. It comes as part and parcel of that dietary composition. And that's what's driving obesity. So then you say to me, okay, well, if that's what's going on, why isn't my leptin working? Because the work we've done shows that insulin blocks leptin at the brain and makes you hungry. So the higher your insulin goes, the more energy you store and the hungrier you get. And there's your vicious cycle of consumption, weight gain, and disease, all being promoted by Excess insulin, which comes from the industrial global diet. Why are we eating more? What happened to make us eat more? We had this exquisite system, very sensitive system called leptin, that allowed us to modulate our total food intake for 50,000 years or more. And then all of a sudden, in 30 years, the thing's broken seemingly beyond repair. How can we eat more than we're supposed to? And the answer lies in understanding the biochemistry of the brain. Because clearly those signals are not working. So one signal is the starvation signal, which is clearly not working. And that's leptin. And leptin tells your brain you've had enough and you can burn energy properly. But when you don't get the leptin signal, your brain thinks it's starving. The second way is in the reward system. So there's an area of your brain called the reward center. The scientific name is the nucleus accumbens. And it is the site where dopamine works. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter and it conveys the feeling of pleasure. And pleasure, for lack of a better word, is good. Except that a lot of pleasure, as it turns out, is not. In the process of going for more pleasure, we have changed our dopamine system and one of the keys to addiction is the idea that after stimulating that system chronically again and again and again, and it takes three weeks to do this, what happens is that the receptors for the dopamine signal now downregulate. Now there are fewer of them. We know that the brains of people with obesity do respond differently to food. In that reward center, when they see palatable food, some parts of the brain light up a lot, that wanting part. But the liking part, once they taste the food, it's blunted. It's not that they're getting more pleasure and reward, they're getting less. That's like living with an urge that you can't satisfy. And so 
people think that this hypo reward condition or this inability to experience the same level of reward from the same foods that other people are getting is causing people to overeat in order to get that dopamine that they're missing. You have to eat more to get the same effect. And that phenomenon is called tolerance. And then when you pull the chemicals that cause the pleasure away, now there's no dopamine and fewer receptors, and that gives you symptoms of withdrawal. So tolerance and withdrawal are the hallmarks of addiction. We know that this occurs with nicotine. That's why we have tobacco addiction. We know this occurs with alcohol. We know this occurs with cocaine, morphine, cannabis. It occurs with every single drug of abuse. And it occurs with sugar too. And that's relatively new data that has come out in, say, the last five years, which shows that sugar specifically down-regulates the same factors, the same receptors in that nucleus accumbens, in the reward center, as does all of these other addictive, abusive compounds. Addiction's a strong word, but it might be a really helpful word to push us to recognize the power of certain food on the brain. There is some evidence that becoming obese does change and blunt that reward system. So we do know that overexposure to McDonald's can cause those brain changes. So food can be just like a drug to certain people who have a certain disposition to addiction. Is it that becoming obese has changed their brain chemistry or is it that they were born with this predisposition and that caused them to become obese? It's very likely that it's a little of each. No one chooses obesity. Obesity chooses them. You think anyone goes out and says, you know, I think I'll go out and be obese today. There is physiology, there is biochemistry underlying every single behavior. Sleeping behavior, eating behavior, sexual behavior, drinking behavior, are all hormonally driven. What we call behavior is not behavior at all. It's the cognitive inhibition on that biochemical drive. And the question is, how long do you think you can exert a cognitive inhibition on a biochemical drive that's going 24-7, 365, getting worse every single day that you don't perform it? No one can exert cognitive inhibition, willpower, over a biochemical drive that goes on every minute of every day of every year. It's just not possible. We think that developing compulsive eating and maybe food addiction reflects some real changes in the wiring of our brain. And that's a scary thought, that becoming obese has changed us forever. Here we have this epidemic of obese six-month-olds. And everyone's saying, how is it possible? How can that be? They don't diet and exercise. They just get fed formula or breast milk and they're obese. How is that possible? Well, it's very possible. Number one, you lay down your fat before you're born. And what determines how much fat you lay down? the baby's insulin before they're born. The more insulin, the more fat. And what determines that baby's insulin? The mother's diet. We need to focus on prevention. When does prevention start? In little kids? In kindergarten? No, it's even earlier. Is it about breastfeeding versus giving them the bottle? that's even too late to start there. It starts in the womb. And it starts actually even before conception in the woman's health. And so young women are shaping the future generation's health. 
They're the gatekeepers. And so we should be putting a lot more effort into promoting a healthy generation of women because they are absolutely shaping the next generation and whether they're coming out all set up for obesity. We know that birth weights have been going up over the last 25 years worldwide. And we know that mother's weight gain during pregnancy, which has also been going up, translates into baby's adiposity, baby's fat stores. So fat cells like to get filled. As soon as they're out, they're hungry. And we see these kids calling for food at age two months, three months, and the parents don't know where this came from. And it's because they were programmed to do so. So what happens to a child who had an obese mom? They might have come out of the womb small for their age or low birth weight, but very soon after that, we see how their metabolic calibration is set in this world. It's set so that they are absolutely efficient and thrifty with calories. So they may have catch-up growth, they may have a period of rapid growth where all of a sudden they've gone from being small to being plump, and then they're actually at risk for childhood obesity. We used to say if a, a child was overweight or obese, that didn't necessarily predict that they were going to be an adult that's obese, and now it's starting to track across time. If you have childhood obesity, you're likely to uh, become an obese adult, and if you've had obesity for that long of a duration, you're likely to have early onset of that whole range of obesity-related diseases. So it's a trajectory that starts with these young women. And if we can't help women who are obese and high stress, if we cannot help them, then we are absolutely determining the future of their offspring. When a woman enters pregnancy at a higher weight, either overweight or obese, she's more likely to gain either inadequate weight or excessive weight per the Institute of Medicine guidelines. So if women are gaining excessive weight and they're already at high weights, this is bad for the woman. She's more likely to have a cesarean section. She's more likely to have um, gestational diabetes, for example. And it puts the fetus at risk because the fetus then can suffer growth retardation or be born with at a large birth weight. So pregnancy is another period that I think as a society we need to rally around and bolster up women's both mental and physical health because that is a short little window where we can dramatically influence the outcomes. The other change that I would suggest is that we think about obesity prevention starting with women of childbearing age women who are not even pregnant yet because they are shaping health of our future generations. As a girl matures, we know that obesity is influencing younger ages of puberty and the need to develop and mature and go through her own reproduction will influence hanging on to calories and hanging on to fat. If they are obese, they are already programming the new little ones that are coming to the world to be set up for obesity and early disease. We know that people are dying younger. We've actually seen it now in the data. This last year, 2009 to 2010, we saw a decline in mean lifespan of three months. The first time in the history of the world where lifespan started to go down instead of up. So this is the gift that keeps on giving. And this can actually be transmitted from generation to generation. Fixing the diet is not just a question of fixing the diet for children, but fixing the diet for the mother who's pregnant, which means fixing the diet for the mother before she comes pregnant, which means all the way back. In other words, fixing it for everybody. That is a public health intervention. One of the 
truisms for obesity and other chronic diseases is that one of the biggest, most reliable predictors of early onset and greater morbidity is through the stress pathway. There are now many models, from animal models to human models, showing that stress matters, that high stress shifts our behavior, our appetite, stimulates overeating, and is related to both insulin resistance, the metabolic syndrome, and general obesity. Under stress, whether it's stress that's threatening losing a job, um, being confronted with medical care bills, there's a number of stressors that are really threatening to us. And under these conditions, it only makes sense biologically and evolutionarily that we would reach for those comfort foods to calm us down, but also to hold on to those calories and be ready for the next assault because they are so threatening. We see this in middle-income families, low-income families, and it depends on this interaction between one's biology and the food environment. And so most of us are gonna accumulate fat under these conditions. Stress causes the same signals that famine does. Stress makes us hungry. Stress turns on the brain pathways that make us crave dense calories. So when we're stressed, we tend to choose less healthy choices, high fat, high sweet food, or high salt. And it's that layering of those three that really reward the brain. And when you have a stressed brain, the food is even more rewarding. We've been wanting for a long time to know if we can reduce someone's psychological stress dramatically, is it gonna change the hormonal environment, lower the stress hormone cortisol, and reduce their abdominal fat. So we rely on a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. It's a very common program. People can get tapes and books about it. We train people to, in a sense, change their mental filter by being more mindful and paying attention to the moment and noticing those thoughts when they start worrying or catastrophizing. We train people to meditate and to recognize their, where they keep tension in their body and notice when they're hungry. So they're really in tune with their physical state, which is a skill that most of us don't have. Easy to develop, but certainly we're kind of numb from the head down. We don't really notice what our body's telling us. So we did this study where we did not ask anyone to cut calories or start exercising more. And so we didn't expect their actual weight on the scale to change, but if, if they really reduce their cortisol, would their fat distribution change? Would they remodel their fat stores away from the belly, maybe more toward the hips, the more estrogenic fat? So that was our hypothesis for this study. And we had wonderful volunteers from the community who really got the idea that this was not a diet, this was a way to change their relationship with food. And believe me, that was a welcome message because people have tried dieting, many types of diets. They most always gain all of their weight back eventually. And so the short-term dieting is not appealing to a lot of people anymore. So we had some, a group of women who were committed to this idea that we weren't gonna ask them to go on a diet, but we were going to ask them to eat differently and notice the process of eating and change the relationship with food. So before meals, people checked in and really figured out how hungry they were and what feelings they were having. And that really sets them up to eat in response to hunger rather than emotions and to eat as much as they need. A reasonable meal while noticing the experience, the pleasure, and the fullness. So it's really much more of a conscious experience rather than eating kind of automatically and habitually and then it's gone and we didn't even really notice that we were eating. We measured their body fat with a DEXA scan. We measured how much trunk fat they had before and after the class. And what we found was that for the obese women, the more they improved on their well-being, decreasing their anxiety and chronic stress, 
the more fat they lost, the more abdominal fat they lost. So this was really what we call a proof of concept study. This showed us that we're really right on a certain mechanism, this kind of stress belly fat, that we might be able to remold that even without a diet. So then we looked at cortisol, and cortisol goes up right after you wake up. It shoots up, especially if you are having a stressful day and thinking about all the things you have to do. And so we looked at this cortisol response to awakening before and after the intervention, and we found that for the obese women, the cortisol morning rise was dramatically reduced. So we really were kind of damping down that stress system. And the more it was reduced, the more belly fat they lost. We hope that this is a mechanism that we can reverse engineer and work on reducing stress and help people to have a healthier fat patterning. Many Americans are under stress and we know that that influences eating behaviors and now we know that it influences metabolism. If we can bring this to the forefront of people's awareness, understanding how our bodies are conditioned to overeat highly palatable food and especially when we're stressed, that's the first step to changing it. How does your sugar consumption, how does your obesity affect me? 274 million a year extra in jet fuel, who cares? Discomfort on the subway because the fat person takes up two seats instead of one, who cares? Sinking of boats due to the weight. A ferry sank in Lake George, no one cares. That ain't it. So what is it? How about $65 billion reduction in productivity due to obesity? How about 50% increase in absenteeism due to obesity? How about $147 billion in healthcare costs due to the metabolic syndrome? How about three surgeons general and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff have declared obesity a threat to national security because people who try to join the armed forces are turned away because of obesity. Does that affect you? Yes, your obesity affects me. Even if you're not obese, you are dramatically affected in every way by our society having an epidemic of obesity and it's affecting the economic balance. It's, it's almost like a, an energy balance on an individual level that has gone to a societal level that permeates both the economic and environmental kind of medium that we all live in and are affected by on a daily basis. The one thing I do know is that we cannot control behavior. We never have and we never will. There is physiology, there is biochemistry underlying every single behavior. Bottom line, we can't control behavior. We never could. When it comes down to it, our hard wiring, our evolutionary biology that determines our survival and our energy balance, it uh, overrides our volition and our will in many cases. And obesity is a perfect example of that because when people get in front of a highly palatable food environment, the brain sends the strongest signals it has for us to quickly and impulsively eat that highly palatable food. So I think that part of the solution is that we have to realize it's not up to the individual, it's up to us as a society, and we absolutely need food policy changes. The, e the economics of food determine how fat our cells are. The fact is, we've had numerous public health measures that have been imposed upon us, initially to our great dismay, consternation, and antagonism. And now, not only do we accept them as just part of daily life, but we embrace them. Examples, fluoridation of water, for cavities, childhood immunizations. These are all things that were anathema 
when they were first brought up. And now they're just a fact of life. In fact, that's what public health is. Public health identifies an exposure where mass behavioral change is going to be required. A mass environmental alteration is going to be needed in order to be able to accomplish it and institutes it for the benefit of society. Not the individual, but for society. When you have something that's toxic and abused at the same time, nicotine, ethanol, cocaine, amphetamine, heroin, morphine, cannabis, that's when regulation has to kick in. And for sugar, which does all of these things, it's both toxic and abused. It's unavoidable and it has negative impact on society. For sugar, we have nothing. Sugar sweetened beverages, whether it's soda or fruit juice that's um, been sweetened, is absolutely the culprit. I mean, we know that from study after study. It's, they're delicious and they're 100% discretionary calories. Discretionary calories means they're extra calories. And right now, no one in America really has in their caloric budget any discretionary space. None of us need the extra soda. So working with industry, whether it's banning soda from the schools, banning soda from certain areas, or putting a tax on soda, something does need to be done to help wake up everyone to the fact that soda and sugar-sweetened beverages in general are not useful. Which is more important, the rights of the individual or the rights of society? And let me tell you, people say, I am trying to scoff on the rights of the individual. Not at all. In fact, I think I'm actually trying to protect them. Here's why. Because currently, in the store, 80% of the food has been laced with sugar. This limits consumer choice. In fact, you can't go into a poor neighborhood in America and get something that's not processed and that is laced with sugar. They don't have availability. Now, whose fault is that? Is that the fault of the poor person? If you have no choice, how can it be personal responsibility? I'm actually trying to reverse that. People say I'm for the nanny state. Far from it. I'm actually trying to reverse the nanny state because the nanny state is already here. We've already been told what to eat by the food industry. And we've gone along with it because it's sweet. We just need to turn the economics of food and agriculture upside down and completely reverse the incentive system so that we're incentivizing healthy food and sustainable farming and taxing the subsidized food which is killing us. The corn everywhere, the high fructose corn syrup. Public health officials consider regulation when four criteria are met. Unavoidability, we've got that. Toxicity, I've explained that. Abuse, and I've explained that. And finally, number four, negative impact on society, what we in public health call externalities. How does your sugar consumption or your obesity affect me? All the criteria for societal intervention are met. So the question is, how do you make your home safe for your child? Number one, get rid of every sugared beverage in the house. There is no such thing as a good sugared beverage, period. And that includes fruit juice. So you say, wait a second, doesn't fruit juice have vitamin C? Take a pill. There's enough vitamin C in all the other foods. You do not need the vitamin C in fruit juice. Number two, we need to keep the insulin down. Insulin's the thing that's driving the weight gain. Insulin's the thing that ultimately impacts on leptin's ability to signal. The way to do that is fiber. If you eat your carbohydrate with fiber, you will lessen the insulin response. Your insulin won't go up as high because your blood sugar won't go up as high. How do you do that? You look at the side of the package. 
and where it says dietary fiber. If it's a solid, you want to look at dietary fiber. You want three grams of fiber or greater. Next, wait 20 minutes for second portions. Kid comes to you and says, I'm hungry. You give him a plate of food. Kid eats the whole plate of food says, I'm still hungry. You look at the kid and say, how can you be hungry? You just ate a whole plate of food. But the kid is. No one wants to be a bad parent, so you give the kid more. What went wrong there? Very simple. There's a hunger hormone in your stomach. It's called ghrelin. When your stomach is empty, ghrelin goes up. It goes to your brain, tells your brain, you're hungry. You eat. Ghrelin goes down. So that should be the end, right? Wrong. The reduction of ghrelin ends up reducing hunger, but it does not induce satiety. Hunger and satiety are two different concepts. Satiety comes at the end of the intestine. So you put the food in the stomach. The food has to traverse 22 feet of intestine. The move, food moves through the intestine through movement of the uh, muscles of the intestine called peristalsis. Gets to the end of the intestine where cells that are specific at the end of the intestine release a hormone called peptide YY which circulates in the bloodstream, goes to your brain, and tells your hypothalamus, the area which controls eating, that you've had enough. That's it. Meal's over. It takes 22 feet of intestine to get that satiety signal. That takes time. So, the third rule, wait 20 minutes for second portions. Let the food work. A way you can move that along, so it's not a whole 20 minutes, maybe 18 or 17, eat your food with fiber because fiber makes the food get through the intestine faster. So you can get the satiety signal sooner. And you can save all of those second portion extra calories. And then number four, the hard one, the killer, the definite problem. Buy your screen time with activity. Buy your TV time, your Facebook time, your video game time, your texting time with activity. If you're outside for a half hour, you can have a half hour of TV. If you're riding your bike for an hour, you can have an hour of video games, etc. The problem is that parents are using the TV as the babysitter, and they don't want to give that up. The exercise has to be consistent and sustained. It does not have to be large but it has to be consistent and sustained, and that is not part of the American diet plan.